Hi, my name is Luz, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Costco Q1 2019 earnings call. All lines have been placed in mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star and then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, you may press the pound key. Thank you. Mr. Richard Galanti, you may begin your conference. Uh, thank you, Luz, and good afternoon to everyone. I'll start by stating that these discussions will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Uh, these statements involves, ri involve risks and uncertainties that may cause actual events, results, and or performance to differ materially from those indicated by such statements. The risks and uncertainties include, but are not limited to, those outlined in today's call, as well as other risks identified from time to time in the company's public statements and reports filed with the SEC. Uh, Forward-looking statements speak only as of the date they are made, and the company does not undertake to update these statements except as required by law. In today's press release, we reported operating results for the first quarter of fiscal 2019, the 12 weeks that ended this past November 25th. Net income for the quarter came in at $767 million, or $1.73 a share, a 19.3% per share increase compared to $640 million, or $1.45 or $1 per share last year in the first quarter. In comparing year-over-year -year operating results, uh, there were three items noted in the release. Uh, one, this year's first quarter benefited from a $59 million or $0.13 cent per share income tax benefit related to stock-based compensation. Uh, last year, the benefit was $41 million or $0.09 cents a share in the first quarter of last year. And number two, the company also recognized an additional tax benefit this year of $27 million or $0.06 cents a share. Uh, this related to the implementation of the uh, 2017 Tax Act. And the third item noted in the release it, uh, this year's first quarter results included a charge of $43 million pre-tax or $31 million after-tax, which is $0.07 cents a share, for an adjustment to our estimate of breakage on rewards for the City Visa co-branded credit card program. Uh, more on this in our discussion of gross margin. In terms of sales, net sales for the quarter came in at $34.31 billion, a 10.3% increase over the $31.12 billion uh, reported last year in the first quarter. In terms of comp sales in the release today, for the 12-week fiscal first quarter, U.S. comp sales on a reported basis were up 11.0%, and X, not only gas inflation and FX, but revenue, rec, uh, revenue recognition, the 11.0 would be 8.3. Canada reported 2.4, X gas, FX, and revenue recognition, it would be plus 5.5. Other international reported 4.0, X those items, plus 5.8. So total company uh, reported 8.8, .8, X gas, FX, and revenue recognition impact 7.5 plus. Uh, E-commerce, uh, 12 weeks reported 32.3, and again, X those items uh, plus 34, 34.0. I'm sorry, 26.2. Um, in terms of Q1 sales metrics, uh, first quarter traffic or shopping frequency increased 4.9% worldwide and within the U.S., 5.2%. Uh, Weakening foreign currencies relative to the U.S. dollar uh, negatively impacted sales. Gas price inflation benefited Q1 comps, uh, and revenue recognition benefited as well. Combined, those three items uh, added about 130 basis points, essentially the difference you see between the 8.8 .8 reported and the 7.5 that I mentioned above. Cannibalization weighed in on the comp by approximately minus 70 basis points. Our average front-end transaction, or ticket, was up 3.7% during Q1. And excluding the impacts from gas and FX and revenue recognition, the average ticket was up approximately 2.4%. Next on the income statement is membership. Uh, membership, we reported an increase of 9.5% or $66 million coming in in the quarter at $758 million in, in the first quarter this year compared to 692 last year. FX had a negative effect of approximately $6.4 million. So the 9.5% increase would have been about 10.4% XFX. Reported membership revenue, uh, again, was up 9.5. Uh, about half of that's related to the membership fee increases taken back in June of 2017. And as you all know, it takes about 23 months to get through the, uh, the uh, book part of the income statement, that benefit. 
Uh, renew- uh, renewal rates for, uh, ro- also rose in Q1. Our U.S. and Canada membership renewal rates in Q1 end were, came in at 90.5%. That's up from 90.4% uh, just 12 weeks earlier at Q4 end. And world right, worldwide rate improved to 88.0, also up a tenth of a percent, up from 87.9% at 12 weeks ago at Q4 end. Uh, in terms of uh, number of members at first quarter end, uh, Gold Star at, at Q1 end was 41.3 million. That compares to 12 weeks earlier, 40.7 million. Business primary, 7.6. Uh, both at quarter end at, at this first quarter end and year end, business add-ons stayed at 3.3. All told, what we started the fiscal year or we ended last fiscal year with 51.6 million uh, members. Uh, we ended Q1 at 52.2. Uh, total cardholders at year end uh, from last quarter was 94.3, and again at this first quarter end it was 95.4. We opened six new warehouses during the quarter. Uh, also, at first quarter end, paid executive memberships came in t- totaled at 19.7 million, which is an increase of 442,000 or 37,000 a week uh, since 12 weeks earlier. Uh, that's one of the biggest weekly deltas. It, part of it depends on when we do different activities to to uh, to you know, get members to upgrade and to as new members sign up as well. Uh, so you'll see that fluctuate, but certainly a good showing in the quarter. Related to the annual fee increases, uh, we, again, I mentioned earlier, we've now passed the halfway point in f- last year's fourth quarter of the 23-month cycle it takes to recognize uh, the incremental benefit from the fee increase. Uh, the benefit will continue to diminish in each of the remaining three quarters uh, in Qs 2, 3, and 4, very little in Q4, actually. And again, that's based on the deferred accounting, which we use. Going down to the gross margin line, our reported gross margin in the fourth quarter was lower year over year by 50 basis points, coming in at 10.75% as compared to 11.25% a year earlier. Now, excluding gas, inflation, and and revenue recognition, uh, that minus 50 would have been a minus 26. And I'll start uh, with my my line items, if you will, and comparing the minus 50 to the minus 26. If you just jot down uh, two columns of numbers, um, the in five lines. Uh, the first line is core merchandise. The second line, ancillary businesses. The third line, 2% reward on the executive membership. The fourth line, other. And then the fifth line, of course, total. On a reported basis, uh, the core merchandise year over year in Q1 was minus 43 basis points. X gas inflation and revenue recognition, the minus 43 would be minus 22. Ancillary businesses, which was a plus five reported, X those items, it would have been a plus 11. 2% reward, 0 and a minus 2. Other, minus 12 and minus 13. And if you add up those two columns, you get to the minus 50 reported, and then X gas inflation revenue recognition, the minus 26. Now, again, going to the, the core, uh, with the minus 43, X those items going to minus 22, that's, again, based on the sales penetration of that as well compared to the total company as well. If you look at just the core merchandise categories in relation to their own sales, what I call core on core, margins year over year were lower by six basis points. Uh, Subcategories within core gross margin year over year in Q1, both food and sundries and hard lines were up, and soft lines and fresh foods were down. And the net of those four categories uh, was a minus six. Ancillary and other businesses, as I mentioned, uh, reported plus five, plus 11 X gas and revenue recognition a quarter. Um, gas was up, e-com was up a little, business center was up a little, uh, pharmacy, uh, a couple of other little things were down a little. But net of those all, they were up 11 basis points, X those items. The other, that's the uh, $43 million pre-tax uh, amount that I mentioned earlier related to the City Visa co-branded card. And we put it here because uh, it's part of uh, part of the deal is uh, is is uh, things like uh, the rewards that are paid out to the cardholders as well as bounties that are earned and revenues that are shared. So this impacts the revenue line of our company or the sales line, and, uh, and therefore it Im- impacts the gross margin percentage. Uh, so the $43 million, this relates to our City Visa co-branded credit card program. Over the past few months, we made the decision to expand our efforts to remind our members to redeem their outstanding rewards. By stepping up our reminders, we saw a step up in the redemptions relative to what we'd experienced previously. Uh, 
These are the reward certificates that were sent out in February of 2018. The rewards program on the City Visa card is a calendar year program. So the, these are the reward certificates that were sent out in February of 18 for rewards earned on City Visa card transactions over calendar 17 and that expire at the end of this calendar year. The $43 million adjustment relates to two things. One, to the thing I just explained, uh, I described to the recent increase in these redemptions, and second, the additional breakage amounts now estimated on the rewards being earned and accrued on calendar year 2018 card transactions. These, these rewards will be sent to these city visa cardholders in February of 2019. So what you see in this line is basically the adjustment to our estimate of breakage on rewards earned on purchases made prior to the beginning of fiscal 19. Going forward, we're using a, this lower reward breakage assumption. Moving to SG&A, our SG&A percentage Q1 over Q1 was lower or better by 23 basis points on a reported basis and flat or zero without gas inflation and rev revenue recognition. Uh, again, it came in 10.13% uh, this year on a reported basis compared to 10.36 last year. Again, I'll ask you to jot down uh, two columns and five line items. Uh, the first column, of course, is reported, and the second is X those items. First line is operations, core operations. Uh, Q119 reported was lower or better by 23 basis points, uh, and lower or better by four uh, X those items. Central, and uh, lower or better, I'll use a plus sign. Central, uh, plus four and plus two. Stock compensation, which is always the biggest impact, seems to be in Q1 because that's when we do our annual grants for over 5,000 employees. Stock compensation, minus four and minus six. And then other is zero. So your total, again, reported uh, the sum of those three line items, tw plus 23 basis points, or lower year over year on a reported basis by 23. And the second column, uh, basically flat year over year on a... Uh, X those items basis. Uh, the core operations component, again, was lower. This is primarily a result of sales growth, in part, uh, uh, offset in part by the U.S. wage increase to our hourly employees that went into effect, to most of our hourly employees, that went into effect on June 11th. The wage increase negatively impacted SG&A by approximately eight basis points in Q1 year over year, and this will continue to impact the SG&A year over year comparisons over the next two quarters. Uh, I believe we did it effective June 11th and 17, so uh, and eight, June 11th, 18, so it'll go through the same time period a year later. Uh, central expense was lower or better year over year by four on a reported basis, and lower or better by two without. Uh, those items. Within that, IT spend in the quarter was uh, flat as a percentage of sales. Stock compensation, as I mentioned, uh, the biggest impact typically is in the first quarter, and, uh, uh, but so you'll see a little bit of a difference there. Uh, next on the income statement is pre-opening expense. Uh, it was $5 million higher this year, in this year's uh, first quarter, coming in at $22 million compared to 17 a year earlier. Uh, we had one more opening this year, um, but there's plenty of other things going on, uh, not just opening new warehouses with everything from chicken plants to expansion of depots and fulfillment. All told, reported operating income in Q1 came in at $949 million uh, compared to $951 million in Q1 last year. Uh, two of the things I mentioned in this report, of course, is the, the $43 million related to the, uh, to the uh, city rewards program, as well as the, uh, uh, the hourly wage increases. Those are certainly two things that have impacted the year-over-year -year comparison. Below the operating income line, reported interest expense was a million dollars lower year-over-year, -year, so 30, coming in at $36 million compared to 37. And on the interest income and other, uh, essentially flat year-over-year, -year, uh, interest income within the number was actually $8 million better year-over-year, -year, higher, higher interest rates and a little higher invested cash balance, offset by FX items that amounted to about $9 million to the negative. Uh, the FX tends to fluctuate both up and down in, in prior quarters. In total, pre-tax income was came in at $935 million compared to $936 million a year ago. In terms of income tax rates, income taxes, our reported tax rate in the first quarter was 16.9% compared to 30.4% in the first quarter of last year. This quarter's tax rate benefited from the lower federal rate related to tax law changes, as well as some favorable discrete adjustments, and notably the $59 million tax benefit related to stock-based compensation uh, compared to $41 million a year ago, and the $27 million benefit related to the implement implementation of the 2017 Tax Act, as I mentioned earlier in the call. For fiscal 19, based on our current estimates, and as I mentioned, 
each quarter. These, of course, are subject to change. We anticipate that our effective total company tax rate for the fiscal 19 to be in the 26.5 to 27% range. This figure is a little more than a percentage point lower than what we had previously estimated, as I had mentioned on our last quarterly conference call. Uh, but lower is good. Uh, a few other items of note in terms of warehouse expansion. Uh, we've opened uh, eight locations, including two reloads, so a net of six in the first quarter. For all of 19, we expect to open uh, 20, about 23 net new warehouses, as well as four relocations, the two we've opened plus two more planned for the rest of the year. Within the 23 net new, about three-quarters of them are in the U.S., and about a quarter of them are international. We're also under construction with our first Costco in China, in Shanghai, with the expected opening, late, the expected opening later in calendar 2019. As of first quarter end, total warehouse square footage stood at 111 million square feet. In, term, excuse me, in terms of stock buybacks, uh, in Q1, we repurchased $34.5 million of stock, 150,000 shares. Uh, I'll turn my attention to e-commerce. Overall, e-commerce sales increase continued at good levels, uh, both for the quarter and just last week. Of course, we reported the four weeks of the, uh, the calendar four weeks of November, which would include the first week of Q2. Um, for the quarter, uh, reported uh, e-commerce uh, came in at 32.3 percent up. X, FX, and Revrec they were up 26 percent. And as as you saw last week, the numbers are even a little higher than that. Uh, for the uh, four-week November period. In fact, uh, um, the good news is we've established all kinds of records for orders and sales during the Black Friday through Cyber Monday weekend, as, as I'm sure many have, else have as well. The top growth categories in the quarter were grocery, consumer electronics, hardware, health and beauty aids, and automotive. Uh, one highlight of our website refinement during the quarter was our re redesign of the home categories. Uh, we feel that the refresh made departments like furniture, domestics, and housewares easier to shop. Um, with that change, we also expanded uh, some of the product selection within those subcategories. Uh, we've now passed our one-year anniversary of the grocery launch last October. Uh, Same-day grocery delivery is now available to members uh, within a 20-minute drive of 99% of our U.S. locations. Uh, Two-day grocery, which we do through our business centers, is available throughout the continental United States. Uh, we continue to uh, focus on providing great values on high-quality merchandise, and we had a few interesting new merchandise on, uh, items online this quarter. A couple of examples, uh, fresh, white truffle, fresh white truffles, uh, golf simulators, all types of high-end uh, cosmetics and creams like La Mer, uh, Pendleton Apparel and Domestics, uh, George Simonson Couture, ca Couture Cashmere Coats, uh, Wheels Up, uh, memberships for air travel, and even a few Super Bowl packages. And uh, hot off the press, uh, we went live online, uh, I think yesterday or last evening, but this morning uh, with a full online, uh, with a nearly complete, with basically a complete line of Apple uh, Mac products, uh, both from MacBook Air to MacBook Pro to the iMac and to the MacBook. And uh, uh, we're excited about that. And uh, stay tuned for uh, similar offerings in store, uh, and we're working out the logistics of that. Uh, we've also continued to improve our online and inline cross-marketing initiatives, uh, continue to do that. In addition to drawing attention to our online offerings uh, via these digital communications, we're leveraging that to highlight and feature warehouse items and hot buys in store and driving traffic. We believe that certainly some of our strength in traffic has to do with that. Uh, in terms of update on buy online and pick up in store, uh, we've expanded the selection, no new categories, uh, but uh, some additional assortment and, you know, testing pickup lockers in a, about 10 locations for this program. Overall, these efforts, you know, continue to, uh, we view as positive impacting our businesses. Uh, and again, most importantly, not only online, but in the warehouse and helping the sales uh, in, in both ways. Uh, quickly on tariffs, there's not a whole lot new to tell you there. Uh, the big news, of course, in the last week or so is the fact that the plan uh, increased on many items of a, from a 10 to a 25% tariff rate effective January 1st has been pushed out, I believe, 60 or 90 days. Um, and so not a whole lot new from a, uh, from a uh, quarter earlier. Uh, there's some items that, uh, you know, when the tariffs have been in the 10 plus percent range have been very little impact on the sales. Uh, some, there's been a little bit more a negative impact. 
Uh, we think we've done a good job, and it's as one of the key mer- senior merchants mentioned, this is what we do with regular price increases as well, cost increases. We figure out how to get uh, to, minim- to minimize it. And uh, we brought in additional containers of certain seasonal merchandise early before the January 1st deadline, uh, and we'll continue to keep you posted. Lastly, in terms of upcoming uh, uh, press releases, we'll announce our December sales results for the five weeks ending Sunday, January 6th on January 9th after the market closes. With that, I will open up to questions, and I'll turn it back uh, to you, Liz. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star then the number one and your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Okay. A first question comes from the line of Michael Laser from UBS. The line is open. Good evening, Richard. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Within your core uh, core on core gross margin, it's been trending a little bit lower over the last couple of quarters. What's been driving that? Are, are you starting to feel the impacts of your pretty rapid e-commerce sales and the margin the margin dilution from that on your core on core gross margin? And then I have a follow up. Um, there's two people in the room here. One uh, senior merchant. There, it's really us. Uh, there's not been a lot of change. I was just looking back at like in the fourth quarter. I believe uh, year over year uh, it was lower by two. I believe in one of the two previous quarters on a year over year quarterly basis is in the four to six range. So it's really, we don't really view it as much more than the things that we're doing to to drive our business. Uh, we get pretty excited figuring out how to drive sales and, you know, whether it's buyer's picks or hot buys or uh, some of the uh, promotional seasonal items, uh, you know, I think I think that's seen in our the strength of our business. Uh, the only thing that I pointed out in the past quarter or two is, is on the fresh side, we've seen a little bit more margin pressure uh, as as there's been a little bit more retail competitive pressure out there, not only from supermarkets but Sam's as well. But that's part of the business. My my follow-up question is on the expense side, recognizing that you've been investing in wages and investing some of the tax benefit that you got, but you have put up some of the best comps we've seen in a, a long time, and the expense leverage has been modest. So when can we start to see that improve? Thank you. Well, yeah, keep in mind, the within these numbers, there's about eight basis points uh, related to specifically to that what I'll call that extra rage increase that we did in uh, June, uh, post the tax uh, the tax act changes. Um, we you know on the on the, e- e- on the IT side we've got a heck of a lot going on. Um, I think it still will bounce around a little bit, but it, having it been flat uh, on a year over year basis in the quarter, we're starting to see that. Um, look, it's it's all sales related. There's there's really a lot of different things. That, you know, we don't go through all the activities activities we've got going on now, whether it's related to, you know, uh, uh, bringing into some of our depots the uh, returns activities, uh, the fulfillment side. You know, with the success, with a, with a rapid rollout a year ago into our business centers of, of the two-day, and frankly, with the success of e-commerce, including a lot of small ticket items or smaller ticket items than just the much higher penetration of bigger ticket items that we used to do. You got a lot of small package fulfillment. We're making sure things get there on time, even if it costs us a little more. So, I mean, there's lots, I could go through a list, there's lots of little things. But I I think uh, we've got a lot of good things going on, and uh, as long as we can keep sales going, you'll you'll see that. But should we interpret that answer as, you know, even if you continue this rate of sales growth, expense leverage should continue to be, Modest? Well, we'll see. I mean, you know, we never want to predict where it's going to go. Our first, we are clearly a top line company. We clearly aren't going to do things to wages or to healthcare costs. You know, one, over the time, people have always asked us, how do we, how do we, what are we doing to control healthcare costs? It's uh, my first somewhat flip, but real answer is expand more overseas. Uh, you know, healthcare costs as a percentage of sales in the U.S. are 20 to 60 basis points as a percent of sales higher than all other countries. Uh, our, our foreign pipeline, uh, international pipeline, is, is it has expanded, and I think you'll see 
you know, that 70-30 or 75-25 U.S. versus international start to, to move with a little more international. So there's, there are things that we, we do to ourselves based on when we do it. We've got a lot, again, we've got a lot of things going on with, a, with, with, with ancillary businesses, with uh, expanding the whole fulfillment and, just, and depot system. I think uh, I'm, I'm beating around the bush because, hey, we can't really tell you where and when. We feel good about we're, we're building to accommodate even more growth on, in e-commerce and on the delivery side. And we know that we'll see some of those costs associated with that come down as a percentage of those sales. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to tell you when. It'll take some time. Okay. Thank you, Richard, and have a good holiday. Oh, by, last one, Michael. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the stock compensation. You know, stock compensation is not just to a, a few people at this company. It's over 5,000 employees. And it's any, in many cases... Uh, from warehouse manager above and, and buying managers and above and certainly the senior people, it's 60 to 80% of compensation. Because of uh, our annual grants that then vest generally over five years uh, are granted in October, uh, which is Q1, uh, the fact that our stock price has increased as well, you'll uh, you, and acceleration related to 25, 30, and 35, that was six basis points of it. You know, you're not going to see that kind of thing forever. Okay. Yeah, you, you tend, if you look back at the last couple of years, you'll see that t typically in the first quarter, and that will ease off in the next three quarters. Thanks again. The next question is from line of Simeon Gottman from Morgan Stanley. You may ask your question. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks. Um, Richard, I, I missed some of the prepared remarks, um, so I, I didn't hear what the core on core merge margin was. But my question is, if, if margins, let's say, came in a little lighter than what the street was looking for, curious if you can talk about, is, is the cost of business going up? Is it reinvestment? Is it investment? Is it external factors? And then I know you don't like to comment on the reinvestment rate, but did, is that, did that change this quarter, given how much of how good sales were, and there's more dollars flowing in? Well, in terms of, we're not that scientific and smart about how we do it. We are, we're merchants at heart, and um, when we see things work, we go for it. As it relates to the core and car, year over year is down six basis points. Um, as I mentioned in the last couple of quarters, uh, we've seen a little bit more competition on the fresh side, which is fine. We've got good fresh sales numbers, but you know we, like others, our competitors are working a little lower margin there, and we're not going to let anybody take it away from us. Uh, but that's a small piece of that delta. Um, there's there's a lot of other moving pieces to it. Part of it is related to the fulfillment side of it, we are encountering slightly smaller margins on some of that stuff as we roll it out very fast. But I, again, we don't really see, uh, in terms of are we investing more because we have it? No, we, we invest more because whether we had it or not, and uh, we see these things working for us. Okay, and then um, just two quick ones. Can you tell us what the e-com penetration is, either the quarter or just where e-com stands? And then the other piece is um, just the cents per gallon or the gas margins. I don't know if you – I'm sure you spoke about what they were in and of themselves, but the, have well, the margins we, widened out? Yeah. Margins and gas have widened out. I mean, everybody – our sense is everybody's making more money out there. As they make more money, we make a little more money, but we sell a heck of a lot of gas. You know, in the last – I don't know what it was this quarter, but in the last couple of quarters, you know, U.S. – whereas overall U.S. gallon consumption is in the very low single digits – We've been in the high single digits of gallon consumption, physical people coming in and filling up their tanks. And so that's all good in that regard. What was the other piece of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, the e-commerce? Uh, the e-com penetration, yes. I think the uh, – I think e – it's, I think it's just under 5%, 4, four 8. That's uh, approximately 4, 8. <laughs> so somewhere between 4, and 5. I think it's 4, 8. But on that, I think it was about 60 or 80 basis points impact to the – Pump? No, higher than that. Okay. Including revenue recognition. Got it. Okay, thanks, Richard. We have the line of Chuck Grom from Gordon Heskett. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Richard. Just on, on the grosses again, um, I think you said uh, overall down 50, X, Rev, Rex, and Gas uh, down 26. Can you 
Can you um, quantify what the actual rev rec impact was for, for 2Q and, and how we should think about that over the upcoming quarters? Um, hold on, what was that? I can't give it to you. I, I don't have it exactly. Revenue overall is down about a half. I'll give you an extreme example, though. Historically, what they call a curated travel package, where we put it together, we have a commitment to the different components of that travel package, be it the hotels or the crews or whatever. Um, historically, that was a brokerage fee, a brokerage commission. And I'm making this up completely, but let's say there was a $500 brokerage commission. You had no sales. And you had five, I'm sorry, you had 500 in sales, the brokerage commission, and essentially no cost of sales. And so it, needless to say, that's a very high margin percentage. Now, if that was related to, again, I'm making this up, a $5,000 Pat cruise package or $5,500 cruise package, you'd have 5500 in sales, 5000 across the sales, and very low. Now, it's a very small piece of our business, but that's oh, for the year, that's $700 million of, it, of that revenue recognition line. So there's lots of moving parts within this thing. Okay, we thought it maybe could be about 10, 12 basis points. I don't know if Bob's there. And I'm sorry, how much? What's so, that? Roughly 10, roughly 10 basis points in the quarter, or we thought that's what it would be. It's a little less than half. Yeah, yeah. Qualitatively, I'm hearing in this room a little less than half of it. So ten sounds like it's a little less than half of twenty-two. Okay, okay, fair enough. And then just again here, just on the model, this 2017 tax uh, impact that you had was that just a one-time item in, in the first quarter? Or is that going to repeat? It, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like it will based on your 26 to 20 percent, 26 to 27 percent tax rate for the year. But just wanted to. Make it, it was it was a one-time. It relates to the tax act, but some of it relates to things that started for us in fiscal 19. Okay. Okay. And, and by the way, there's. There's still some moving parts to the Tax Act. I mean, it's hundreds of pages. Some of the things still weren't completely outlined. Um, there may be a little pluses and minuses. This was a little bit bigger than a little plus, which was good. Okay. And then just with, uh, I think, a year now under the belt with Costco Grocery and Instacart, I'm just wondering, it doesn't seem like it based on how strong November was. Just wondering if you think you're, you're losing any in-store traffic from somebody just replacing that trip with, with buying online, either through CG or, or Instacart? I mean, the, the view is it's incremental. It's hard to say when the, when the, the, the in-store penetra- uh, frequencies are so strong. Um, and uh, I don't think we've done a lot of polling of members to see, you know, is this incremental or not. Uh, but we're, 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 we feel that we're seeing less than we originally thought, which wasn't a lot to begin with in terms of does it take away from the frequency in store. It can't add to it, but it, it has opened some new markets for us or some expanded markets. Um, you know, anecdotally, I have plenty of friends that come up to me and ask, tell me that how, how, they, how they love it uh, in terms of they're doing more of some of their incremental food shopping that way or making it more convenient to themselves. And we're finding that people that live further away are using it more. But these are all anecdotal, nothing science-related to those, my comments there. Okay, and just, just to pop on Simon's question about the e-commerce margins, my understanding is historically it's been a margin accretive category for you. In other words, it, it, it garners a higher margin than, than the store uh, margin. Just, I just no. want to make sure that, that that's Lord, still in Lord. fact correct. No, no, that maybe, maybe it's, that's, it's, it's, no that, that's never been a higher margin. It's been a little lower margin. Uh, you've got competitive categories like uh, electronics and things, which you know, dominates the penetration. And then there's cost of shipping. Uh, and so it's, it's a little lower margin. It's a little lower margin and a lot lower SG&A, so it's a higher P&L, if you will, in terms of you know, the earnings, the recognizing that not every expense is allocated uh, back to it. Oh, okay, I understand. Thanks very much. The next question is from Ajahn Heinbachel from Guggenheim Securities. Your line is open. So, Richard, a couple of things. Did, did you see any, any um, COGS pressure from uh, port congestion, right, either you know, having to pay to prioritize, fly product in, or, and, and are, you, are you seeing any of that today, uh, you know, as, as, we, as we go in, into 19? 
nothing more than usual at this time of year. Again, anecdotally, I know that when we had very strong produce sales on a few items like watermelons around Labor Day, when you had to get an extra container somewhere fast, not shipping across, I'm just talking about truck container, you know, truck containers on this side, trailers, um, something you paid $1,500 for might cost $3,500 for that last truck. Uh, but again, these were anecdotal stories I heard. My understanding is there was a little backup in, in, in China and Shanghai, but not a heck of a lot there. And you know, part of that is is every extra container that was out there, merchants like Costco were filling them to bring in things in anticipation of certain tariffs going to 25% on January 1st. Can I interest then, you in some patio furniture? <laughs> You know, and then broader on supply chain, right? So you think about, I guess, calendar 19. Um, you know, what, uh, take the, is the chicken plant the only lumpy thing? So I think that's still slated for calendar 19. You know, the, the, the opening of that, can that, will that actually, will we actually be able to see that in, in the P&L? And is there anything else lumpy like that that might impact uh, specifically supply chain in 19? Well, first of all, I think the plan is is by early summer, they'll start processing, but not at 100% capacity, and that'll take six or eight months to get to 100% capacity. So it's really into fiscal 20, uh, uh, or even mid-fiscal 20, where for God willing, it's running smoothly and it full or close to full capacity. There's a few other things that aren't as big and slightly less lumpy. We Last year, we opened a commissary, bakery commissary in Canada. It's by no means at full capacity yet. Um, we're adding items items that we sell but doing some things that it didn't we didn't start off doing there same thing we uh we've had a meat plan in tracy california for 20 plus years uh we opened uh, a second meat plan in morris illinois that'll handle the midwest and east coast it's by no means at full capacity yet and uh so there's some lumpiness and that's that's the, both of those latter two things have been around well, the commissary's been around for over a year uh, maybe closer to two, and uh, and the meat plant's been around for a, a year-ish. And so the, the, those are some of those, when I talked earlier about, I think Mike Lass, Michael Lasser was talking about, are there other, what other things are, you know, are, challenge, are challenges to SGNA? There's lots of little things like that. Notably, uh, some additional, you know, the ramp up and getting up and running fulfillment, both for e-commerce and on those other two-day deliveries. So we got a lot of little things going on like that. The big lumpy is going to be, I mean, just by sure size of it is the chicken plant, but that has more to do with there's a, there'll be some more pre-opening and there'll be some uh, uh, perhaps a little more depreciation. All right, and then just lastly, are you seeing any early signs of uh, a pickup in uh, fresh inflation, meat, produce, Looks like it might be percolating a little bit, but have you seen that yet? We haven't. Okay. Uh, okay. One of the merchants here is shaking their head. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next question is from Chris Horvers from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Thanks. Good evening. So first, first on the RevRec so as we think about that gross margin pressure that he experienced uh, in this quarter, is that, is that something you expect for the rest of the year? Essentially, there, there's no recapture. It'll be a pressure all year because of the change in the accounting. Uh, and then also on, on the top line front, I know you mentioned that you know, there was a benefit to, to, to this month on the top line in November, but that has pressure in December and January. So over the year is, is the, the RevRec impact of the top line neutral. That latter question related really to ecom. Um, no, RevRec will be for the year. Um, you know, I think in in uh, I think our September sales release we talked about the fact that for all of 19 we estimate that this new standard will you know benefit sales by about one percent, so one point something billion dollars. Uh, some of the things have more margin percentage impact, but at the end of, at the end of, at the end of the day, it has no impact on the bottom line. But, the, but un, understood, so you had a big benefit in this sort of the November, November month in, the, in this quarter because of e-commerce, right? And that's RevRec. So you had a bigger benefit now, so it just mitigates throughout the rest of the year, essentially, or goes uh, the other yeah, way? There's probably, relatively speaking, there's a bigger benefit in the end of Q1 and into December because of the holidays and the strength in e-commerce. 
Okay. And then the gross margin, I know it, it's up and down to the SG&A line, but the gross margin impact persists all year. Or As some it relates, it. Yeah, some degree of it, yes. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Optically, it'll be an eight to ten basis point headwind. Understood. And then, you know, in terms of um, you know the e-commerce strength in the month of November, you've had a lot of stuff. The website, you're advertising it more. Were you more, I guess, aggressive with advertising or promotions because it was Black Friday, or is this just a new normalized rate of like? hey, this is what we're offering, and, and sort of there's, there's some sustainability to that growth that you saw in, in the month of November. Uh, there are the same number of ads or marketing pieces. Uh, we have more emails that we're sending to. We've done a better job over the year of collecting emails. There's better values. Uh, I think a year ago we talked about not only in, online but in-store, better values, hot buys and buyer's picks. That, you know, higher traffic, higher conversion as well. And those are all things, some of that stuff is, you know, improving your site 101, recognizing that you know, some of these things we hadn't done as well in years prior, uh, and the values. I mean, I think we're, we've are we gotten the attention of the, the suppliers in many cases, and uh, they're coming up to they, – they, they, they see how it's improved their business. Uh, Particularly in an environment where, in some cases, those products aren't doing as well as our competitor brick-and-mortar operators. Yeah, I, I bought a snowblower and it was like 30% cheaper than what I could find at a big box store. So in November, that was my, that was my Black Friday gift. Uh, my last question, <laughs> uh, uh, and they delivered it to my garage. Um, my my last question is, what percentage of e-commerce are you shipping currently, are you, are versus direct from vendor, and and where do you think this goes over time? And you know, like what sort of cost savings do you generate over time? We're shipping about 50% ourselves, and that tends to be the smaller size items uh, and uh, you know, small pack sizes and what have you. All the big stuff and all the white club stuff, like white goods, uh, big electronics, um, furniture, patio furniture, those typically are done by third parties. Is that percentage going to go up over time, or just because the, the mix of small items goes up, that's what drives it up? We'll have to see. I mean... Whatever's you know, it's, we're going to do it whatever way is most economical. My guess is there are going to be some things that we're current doing third party that we'll bring in house as we get better and more confident of being able to do it. If you think even of going back to some basic things like what we're doing with UPS with two day dry, it's not e-commerce but it's two day dry. Um, what other things can we do in that box size? Um, we uh, we're working with vendors as others are, I'm sure as well, to figure out how to get certain products. Cl- you know, how to minimize the freight cost by getting, given our volumes and our predictability of certain items, how we can get closer in a more efficient freight way to the, to the ultimate delivery to the customer. Got it. Thank you. The next question comes from the line is Karen Short from Barclays. Your line is open. Hi. A, a couple questions. Um, just on... Um, tariffs. Can you maybe just elaborate a little on what your pricing philosophy will be res- with respect to tariffs, meaning will you address you know, price, I guess, increases if you need to on an, a, a skew-by-skew basis, or are you looking at the whole box more broadly and trying to figure out how you can offset with, with a lower price increase across the box? It's a skew-by-skew basis, recognizing it's a heck of a lot easier to do when you're only selling 3,800 SKUs in its entirety to start with. Um, and again, it's part of it is price points. Again, I, I was talking to a, a merchant yesterday, and they're giving me examples of where on a 40 or $50 item that's up 20% or 15, 10 to 25%, they've seen no change in the unit volumes. Uh, and there's some, and, and first of all, if it's in the 10% range, I think we've done – we feel we've done a good job of working with the supplier. You know, what is the supplier willing to do? Uh, what, uh, and uh, to try to minimize that, or if there's competing suppliers, you know, getting even more. So there's some items that even with a 10% increase, we haven't had to change the price. Now, maybe we ate into our margin a little. Sometimes not at all. There's some items, bigger ticket items, where you, if you're going to go to from 500 to, you know, to six and a quarter at 25%, or, uh, or uh, that's 
that may impact the unit volume of that stuff. In some cases, in anticipation of a 25% coming, we cut back quantity a little bit on some items. So it's all over the board. But overall, okay. as you might expect, Karen, we're going to be the last to increase and the lowest, but it's clearly not subsidizing it with other things. Okay. Um, and then I guess just a color, a little more color on your comment on Fresh getting more competitive with both conventional um, and SAMs. Can you just give a little more color on what you're seeing exactly? And then I guess the question, bigger question I have is, I mean, isn't there a possibility that SAMs continues to get more aggressive on other categories? I mean, it, the pressure will likely spread. So I guess are you seeing any of that today or is it just limited to Fresh? Look, we're respectful competitors. Uh, we've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, we're not moving away, and, uh, and we feel we're in a pretty strong uh, uh, area. I mean, within fresh, it's produce and, and, and protein, and uh, and we don't, you know, whatever comes our way, we'll figure it out. And it's, I'm only pointing, you know, part of the challenge here in trying to be helpful to all of you guys is give you some examples. It so happens that fresh right now, year over year, is down a little bit. There are times when it's been up. Right now, it's notable. Um, we still feel that we're getting more bang from our buck from having Sam's close 63 units than certain incremental competition on certain things. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we do. We compete. Okay. And then just last question. You used to comment on testing uh, pickup lockers in 10 locations. Uh, can you maybe just elaborate, like, like how big are the pickup lockers? How, you know, is there a, a, are you kind of looking to maybe expand that or broaden it? And then what kind of SKUs would be able to fit? And currently, well, the they're lockers? not. I don't. I don't think they don't. They won't fit a 60-inch television, as an example. Uh, they're, they're relatively small and clean looking. They're, you know, I think in uh, their 10 locations. Keep in mind the items that we started with and we chose to do, first of all, were items where we had heard time and again, I would have bought that from you, Costco, but I can't have it shipped to my office and I don't want it to be left, be left on our door, my doorstep until I get home from work. And so we think we've picked up a little incremental there, but what we're finding is is that many of these customers, they shipped it, they bought it that way. First of all, we have more availability of items because we offer a much broader selection that you can order online and pick up in store. And, and these items really are limited to jewelry items, some small electronics items, and handbags. Okay. Yeah. All buildings, by the way, offer the service uh, and, and show you that there's more out there. But uh, it, it, look, it's a test. We'll figure it out. Okay. Thanks. What we're what, what we're not looking to do anytime soon is, you know, full order online to pick up in store or for groceries and you know, A, we don't have the room up front, and B, we, we see, we're probably a little biased, but we see that when, you know, not every customer shows up when they order online, and you have to separate it between dry and refrigerated and frozen. It's very costly. Right. Yep. And, and we do have the alternative now with, uh, with the Instacart engine. Right. Okay. Thank you. We have the line of Edward Kelly from Wells Fargo. You may ask your question. Yeah, hi, guys. Good afternoon. Um, Richard, you mentioned uh, ga the gas business and margins uh, rising everywhere. You know, we are seeing that at, at our other companies. Just thoughts on, on the reason for that and the, su the sustainability of that? Well, I, I think the reason is, is – Traditional retailer, all companies, including us, we want to make money. And what we have found is, is that as prices have come down, our view is, is our our moat, if you will, our competitive pricing has gotten bigger. Uh, what we're sa what we're saving, you can just look every week at GasBuddy.com, but we do our own price studies. But we're saving our customer relative to competitor stations nearby, whether they're independents or or or, or, or supermarkets or, or or nationals. Uh, we're saving them more. We're saving more today than we've ever saved them per gallon, and we're making more than we've ever made. Partly because everybody else is making more, and we're able to make a little more. How long does it last? I don't know. It does seem that there's not a heck of a lot of traction on gas prices going up. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I mentioned earlier. You know, you've heard this from me before. We make, we make we want to make a little a lot of times as it relates to gas. I mean, we've been enjoying for the last several quarters on a year over year basis. You know, close to high single digit gallon comps in a in a U.S. population where it's just above flat in the low single digits. So we're definitely taking market share, and we're enjoying able to do that while making a little more, but not a lot more. And I just. I just want to take a step back and um, you know and ask you a question about about EBIT growth. You know, if we look at EBIT growth this quarter and, and adjust for you know one-time items like the charge on the breakage, um, adjust for the wage investment, um, remove the MFI benefit. Um, if you do all that, it looks like EBIT grew somewhere in sort of like the three and a half to four percent range. Um, that was about the same as it was last quarter, but yet your comp is seven to eight um, percent. You know, fuels contributing. I'm just kind of curious if we take a step back here, ha- help us understand how we how we read that. I guess um, you know why that number is is not better, and and then how do we think about you know going forward? Because you know you might not be comping seven to eight percent forever. Um, does can the flow right. through improve from here? Right. Well, first of all, you know, two things. You mentioned the three to four percent. I think if you add those two items in, uh, that impacted the pre-tax. It's six or seven percent, but even that. And, uh, and when I say the two items, the uh, the city visa breakage as well as the our payroll increase that, uh, on top of everything, we took because of the tax, the, the income tax. Uh, you know, we knew we were going to some of that income tax was going to impact the pre-tax line in that way. Uh, the other thing, and get back to a couple of the other questions on. There's lots of stuff going on here, guys, and uh, and I think we're less worried about was gross margin. You know, five or ten basis points different than it could have been. It could have been a lot better than what we did. We don't look at it that way. We look at what we can do to drive our business, and uh, still want to make money. We still think long term we're creating a stronger, a stronger, more loyal company. So I, I think that uh, you know we're optimistic about what our future holds in that regard. I can't tell you. I can't give you guidance of where it'll go. Okay. Thank you. Oh, by the way, yeah, by the way, in addition to just the payroll hitting the tax, you know, in our case, rough numbers, the first full year post tax, the tax reform, it's about little. It was on, on those pre-tax earnings. It was a little over three hundred million pre-tax. So it's a little over four hundred million. Uh, sorry, a little over three hundred million tax benefit. So that's a little over four hundred million pre-tax. One hundred ten or one hundred twenty of it went towards. Uh, went towards uh, you know those wages. Uh, we view these monies as partly our members, and we're doing what we do to drive our business. I mean, certainly, uh, what we did to remind our members of the uh, of those that have the city visa card to drive that business, which is long term positive, uh, you know, through the revenue share when it's used outside, as we get more and more people to have it, and more and more of them to have it top of wallet. So we think again, all these things are are driving clearly. We in the first year of we, first year of of of, of two day delivery and fresh. Of, I'm sorry, two day delivery and a big ramp up in small package with the monies we're investing in, in fulfillment and the monies we're clearly delivering a package to our member even on the on the two day delivery side at a more expensive price when we first started than today, which is still more expensive than it will be tomorrow. Hello. Oh, we have Rupesh Parikh from Oppenheimer. Your question, your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. So first on the tax rate, a housekeeping question. The tax rate that you gave, the guidance, did that exclude the benefits that you saw in Q1? Does, it, does the tax, yes, it excludes the benefit, those, those unusual things. Yeah. Okay, great. And then on, on the capital allocation front, the so share buybacks, again, uh, you guys are not, you're not buying that many shares back. I'm uh, just curious, you know, on, on the special dividend and, you know, just how you're thinking about capital allocation going forward. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of buying back stock, we do buy it regularly. You know, we have a, we have a matrix that we look at and we adjust periodically. 
as the stock goes up, we buy a little less each day. The stock goes down, we buy a little more. We tended, even if it was a small number for the quarter, it was a little higher towards the end of the quarter, the beginning of the quarter. But that doesn't, we'll see what next quarter brings. As it relates to special dividends, uh, we have made no decision on a fourth special dividend. Uh, we've been asked time, time and again because the, each of the three that we've done were spaced about two and a half, two and a quarter years apart from each other. Uh, so we've been asked what happens in two and a quarter years from May of 17. And we've said, we don't know. Well, you know, stay tuned and see. We, they, when we've done them, uh, they've worked well. We still continue to generate a lot of cash in excess of our CapEx and in excess of a roughly billion-dollar annual dividend that has grown historically about 13% a year. So it's certainly on the table, but there's no promises of, of, of if and when and how much. Okay, great. Thank uh, you. Why don't we take uh, two more questions? And next question from Scott Cicciarelli of RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Scott Ciccarelli. Um, uh, Richard, as you guys change your uh, accrual for the, the rewards breakage, is that something that will be a notable item on a go-forward basis, or is it relatively minor and kind of gets lost in the wash? It's, well, it's relatively minor. Keep in mind, you're talking about an annual reward that's in the $2 billion range. Uh, a little, and uh, if you look at it, this really affected. We started doing this a few months ago. These reminders in a bigger way, and if you look at it, it, it sped up or increased the ones that were going to not be redeemed through that related to 2007 calendar purchases on that card, and then we had to then up the accrual for all purchases in 18. We had already lowered the accrual from prior to this from the previous year, uh, but you know that's what we do. Um, on an ongoing basis, I think the, the impact to the quarter relative to our old one was about a penny a share. Okay, got it. I think it was a little. Okay. I think it was like six and a half, seven million dollars pre-tax. Understood. So you could you could you could annualize that component on an annual basis. Okay, and then I wanted to clarify the answer you gave to an earlier question. I think it was from uh, Chuck regarding the profitability of e-commerce. Um, can you help us? I, I, I was also under the impression that um, e-commerce was a higher, let's call it, operating profit uh, transaction for you. But the way you kind of phrased it, it sounds like it's it's a lower gross margin, but maybe at the EBIT, it's a contribu uh, a positive contributor. Is, no, is no, it, right? it, it's a higher, it's a more profitable operating margin. It has a little lower gross margin and a lot lower SG&A. Maybe a lot lower SG&A is more appropriately termed lower SG&A because there are a few things that we don't allocate necessarily to it. But like when you buy something online and return in a warehouse, the warehouse gets uh, gets uh, charges for that. Uh, so, th you know, we try to do a, not a complete full, but, uh, uh, you know, it's charged, IT, uh, it's charged for its IT expenses and things like that, certainly all the direct buying and what have you. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it's clear, it is, we, we view it as more profitable than the bottom line of our company as a whole. Got it, and that that but that not, is a, but not a lot. Fulfillment. But, what? I'm sorry, and and that is true whether it's being shipped by you or the third party that you referenced to an earlier question. It, it's all blended together. Got it. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Okay, one last question. And for our last question, we have Scott Moshkin of Wolf. Your line is open. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking me, my question. So I just wanted to make sure I understood the answer to the last question of the forty-three million. It, it sounded like seven, six to seven million of it is actually not one time. It's going to be kind of an ongoing. Did I get that right, or am I mis misunderstanding? Well, the forty-three million relates to activities re prior to the beginning of fiscal two thousand nineteen. That's one time in the sense that it goes back to ex anticipated redemptions higher than, w than what had been previously reserved for, both for calendar, se calendar 7, January 1st through December 31st, calendar 17 purchases or transactions, both in and outside of Costco on the City Visa card. Uh, from February of 18, when they were mailed out to everybody, they've been redeemed. Uh, in the last few months, we upped the n amount of times we remind our members to redeem them that increased the redemption. So based on what we had previously thought would be redeemed and not expire as of December 31st of this year, we upped the ante on that piece. That's you know, a little over a third of that 42. The other piece is all purchases made on this year 
those card members will receive a reward certificate in February of 19. But every time a transaction is a, a, a reward is earned, we we accrue a little bit of the anticipated breakage or slippage in it. Well, with our with our reminders, we are going to accrue a little less for that. So it's also all the purchases made from January 1st, 18 through the end of August or September 2nd, whatever the year end was of fiscal 18, we upped the accrual on that. In Q1, based on our lower breakage assumption, and therefore higher accrual of breakage, uh, a lower breakage assumption, so uh, it'll, uh, that was about just under seven million pre-tax. That's the piece that will be ongoing. Okay. So, so, okay. So I think uh, I think I got that. So then so, my, my and the total was about forty nine and almost fifty million. Forty three was one time prior one time. to Q one. Yeah. Perfect. Then, then my second question is: um, it's more strategic. I mean, we're seeing a lot of companies, and I think. Uh, a couple of questions got to this is that you know as we go more more and more omni channel the flow through of, of sales diminishes um, the profitability just kind of comes in um, how do you think about Costco I mean Costco has seemed not to have this problem but you know maybe we are seeing a little bit of it as we go more omni channel just the profitability of the business gets a little bit uh, it comes down a little bit how do you think about that and how should we be thinking about that well I think that we are, for, in my view, we're fortunate that we're not impacted. You know, if you look at traditional department stores, which deliver stuff to your home and then you send 70% of it back, it's all free. Uh, that's a necessary part of their business that's not necessarily profitable relative to the old way. Uh, in supermarkets, I don't think delivery, to the extent you can incrementally take a customer or, or, or grow market share, uh, that'll be incremental. Maybe that's the negative is offset by the positive of the incremental sales. I think we've been fortunate. The way we've done it as it relates to e-commerce in general or even, you know, two-day delivery, we didn't go and, you know, spend hundreds if not a billion dollars on a, 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 our own delivery. We're doing it with, a, in that case, a partner of UPS, limiting the things that we do, and it seems to be working. Now, we're still going to improve the cost of delivery on even that because our, uh, there's some parts. We want to be in the entire continental United States, and there's some places that are a little further away, so we pay a little more on, on, on that. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, when we look at, to the extent it's incremental, you know, we have found, I think we've also benefited from things like, you look at white goods. Historically, when we had limited white goods in store, I think four fiscal years ago, we did $50 million in the U.S. in white goods. Three years later, in fiscal 18, we did $500 million, like 50 something in white goods. None of it in store. We have displays in locations, in, in display, high-end LG, Samsung, Whirlpool, and the like, and, you, and most people want it delivered and actually the old one taken away. So all that white glove service. Uh, we have been fortunate in that regard. There's an example of because of what's happened in the world. You look, I, you've heard me mention apparel where brick and mortar apparel is generally down over the last few years. Uh, that's given us an opening to buy certain things that historically we couldn't in the quantities. 99 plus percent of our apparel is still in store, not online. We're testing a few things online. It's a seven billion dollar category that's grown, uh, uh, compounded for four years in the high eights. Furniture, we would have it in store, limited, you know, twenty, thirty thousand feet of furniture for eight, eight, twelve weeks in the summer, the slow, you know, after Memorial Day and before Labor Day. We still do some of that in store, but now it's year round online. Uh, same with patio furniture, which is in there for twelve or so weeks. January through parts you know, maybe early April, and, and now the the geographically the locations that where people buy that stuff year round have the ability to do that. So I think we've been fortunate. There's some things that, given our item nature of our business, has helped us in that regard, and perhaps offset of that. Clearly, uh, you know, Scott, in, in the first couple of years, uh, it's certain of these things cost us more. Uh, building out some fulfillment centers. We're, part of that success online is getting people to open the email to to click on something and, and, and to buy something. And we're, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a, a few years here, uh, I'm sure, have continued that. But, you know, these strong sales have helped that. 
All right, perfect. Hey, listen, have a have a great holiday, and thanks uh, thanks for the, the the great explanation. Well, we try. Thank you. You guys have a good holiday as well. Thank you very much. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you, everyone, for participating. You may now disconnect.